Hello, I am Anurag Tripathi. I am a faculty member in the Department of Physics at IIT Hyderabad and I will be the instru instructor of this course which is Introduction to Quantum Field Theory. Uh, we will be mainly covering here theory of scalar fields. Okay? So, I would not be um, doing quantization of fermionic fields or gauge fields in this course and uh, this will be mostly in fact solely canonical quantization which will be covered in this course. And this is a 30 hours course which will run for 12 weeks. And the, the, the formulation that we are going to uh, develop here, okay, this the framework of quantum field theory that we develop here, it, it, it can be applied to uh, theory of fermionic fields as well. So, you could construct for example, electrodynamics using it, uh, but we will restrict to scalar fields as I said. And there are few prerequisites for this course. Let me write it down. Okay, so let's see how it works. Okay, so here are the prerequisites. I am not so sure about the spelling, requisites, hopefully it is correct. So, you should have encountered um, quantum mechanics in your master course. Okay. And then of course, um, special relativity. And then you should have also studied classical mechanics in your master, master's course. Meaning you should be familiar with the concept of action, how to obtain equations of motion using variational principles from the action, okay, so principle of least action that you should know, how to construct Hamiltonian and, and uh, other related things. So, these three courses you must have taken okay, and uh, to have some idea of fields, it will also be useful if you have taken a course on, on electrodynamics. Okay. So, these three together uh, form the uh, prerequisites for this course. Okay. Then you should know how to construct a quantum theory given a classical theory. So, it might have been covered in your um, quantum mechanics course, but let me nevertheless um, mention here. So, suppose you have some system which is described by generalized coordinates which I label as q i okay? and where i runs from 1 to n where n is the degrees of freedom that system has and p is too big. Pj's are the momentum conjugate to the variables qi, okay, to the coordinates qi. So these are your canonically conjugate conjugate variables, okay, and this is um, at the classical level. Now to make a quantum theory for the classical system which is described by these coordinates, okay, what you have to do is replace the Poisson brackets by commutators and you have to throw in a ih bar. So, 
you should have also studied Poisson brackets in your course. So, if you construct Poisson bracket of Q with a P, okay, this curly brackets I am using to denote Poisson brackets, and if you do so, you get delta i j. Okay. And of course, the Poisson brackets of q with itself and p, okay, let, let me write down Poisson bracket. So, this is one relation and of course, the other ones are this. So, a Poisson bracket of a q with another q or with itself is 0. Similarly, for the conjugate momentum p, is 0 and q with p is non-zero when q and p are, are conjugates of each other. Okay? If the index i and j are different, then of course, it is 0. So, the prescription for going from the classical description, description to quantum mechanical descript description is this. Let me write it down here. So, this is classical mechanics and you want to make a quantum theory here. So, what you do is first you promote all the um, coordinates, all the q's and p's to operators. So, they become operators now. Okay, That is um, what the hat is indicating that these are operators. And the Poisson, bracket, um, Poisson brackets are replaced by commutators. So, you define q i hat q j hat commutator is 0 that you would have already studied in your quantum mechanics. Similarly, p i hat p j hat is equal to 0. Okay. So, what we are doing here is, okay, let me write down this one and then it will be clear what I am doing. P j. Okay. So, you form this commutator, sorry, P j. Then this thing is replaced by or it uh, is equal to i h bar the Poisson bracket you calculated in the classical theory. Let us check that is correct. Okay. And what did you calculate? Uh, Q i hat p j hat was delta i j. So, it becomes i h bar delta i j okay, where delta is the Kronecker delta. So, if you are looking at q comma p where q and p are conjugate variables then it just becomes i h bar okay, and that is the commutator you know uh, you have in quantum mechanics. Okay. So, that is the prescription how you make a quantum theory starting with classical theory you take the coordinates take the conjugate momenta calculate the Poisson, bracket, uh, Poisson brackets and to make the theory in quantum uh, quantum theory, you promote them to operators, define a commutator and commutator will be the same as your Poisson bracket in the classical theory times i h bar. Okay, that is how you make quantum theory out of a classical theory, that is a prescription. Okay, so, this uh, you should uh, keep in mind this we are going to use uh, several times and most likely you have already encountered this. Okay. So, these forms the uh, prerequisites I have listed down in some uh, material here. Let me mention some of the books that you can refer to and uh, which I will also use in this course. So, let me write here on the next page. I will not write the titles, I will just write the names. So, you have a book by Peskin and Schroeder. Uh, 
S C H R O E D E R. Okay, the title is an introduction to quantum field theory. Okay. Another book is by Anthony Z. It's a very nicely written book. Okay, its title is Quantum Field Theory in a Nutshell. Then you have Weinberg. So there are three volumes to um, this series, and the one which will be most useful for this course is the Quantum Theory of Fields, Volume One. You have book by George Sturman. Okay, it's called An Introduction to Quantum Field Theory. That's also a very very nice book. It goes into details which are usually not covered in other books. So uh, I would also recommend this book. You have Ittyakson and Zubair. I T Y no. I T Z Y K S O N. Ittyakson and Zubair. That's also a very nice book. And of course. You have lectures by Ashok Sen. You can uh, visit his um, web page, and you'll find uh, his lectures there. And this book by Raymond. Okay, this is called Field Theory: A Modern Premier. Okay, and of course there are many other books which have come recently. In, in last few years, and you can also uh, refer to them. Okay, so these are um, all the references that I have. Okay, good. Then uh, let's ask why we are going to study this course. What's the requirement of having quantum field theory? Okay, to um, Set the stage for this course. Imagine this: you have an electron and a positron. Okay, positron is an antiparticle of the electron. Okay, and these two particles are rushing towards each other at very, very high speeds, speeds that are very near to the speed of light. Okay, so they are coming with Enormous speeds, so there's a lot of energy in this system, okay, and they collide. This is something which was done at the LEP, for example, Large Electron Proton Collider. Now, when this collision happens, both the electron and the positron they disappear; they do not exist anymore. Okay, what is produced is a variety of particles many many things are produced okay you you can be producing higgs bosons you can be producing photons okay w bosons z boson okay um, even even quarks anti quarks and gluons so you could be producing all these things which were not there to begin with and what was there to begin with that electron and that positron that disappeared okay now if you want to describe this system it's time evolution okay. the quantum mechanics or single particle quantum mechanics that you have learned uh, is not going to work okay it's not going to work for a simple reason because when you set up those equations um, like schrodinger equation for example okay the wave function psi in there describes the probability of finding a particle, let's say that electron and that positron, whichever one you, you choose, uh, in space and time. Okay. And you remember the if if you take that wave function psi, you have to normalize that wave function, of course. But then the interpretation is that it represents a probability density. And if I integrate over the entire universe, I get one. Meaning, let me emphasize this a little more. 
by putting these arguments. Okay. Meaning, this particle exists somewhere in the universe at all times. Right? But the process that I described, there that electron disappears, it's not there anymore. And not only that, new particles were created. But here you have this requirement that the particle has to exist at all times. So, you cannot um, deal with creation of particles or annihilation of particles using uh, single particle quantum mechanics, for example, uh, your Schrodinger equation. Okay? So, that is not going to work. And Clearly, we need a different um, formalism to deal with such situations and that formalism is that of quantum field theory. So, idea is the following. What we will do is, um, we will treat that psi you get here. Okay. That is the wave function which satisfies um, Schrodinger equation. We will treat it as a classical field. Okay. We will say, okay, even though we got it because we are doing quantum mechanics, but now, good, I, I do not want to treat it as a quantum mechanical thing anymore. I will say it is a field which is satisfying some equation, which is Schrodinger equation, but I will treat it as, it as if it is something classical. Okay. And then I will quantize that field. Okay, and it works. It works. It does what we need, and uh, you will see that um, that happens in the course. Okay, now how to get this idea is a separate issue. But let's say we uh, accept that this is really working. Uh, we can check. Then um, let's proceed with quantizing of fields rather than okay quantizing the coordinates. Okay, earlier you were quantizing the coordinates. You were saying you have q, you have p, and you put a computation relation. But here you will now be quantizing the fields. Okay, so that's what we are going to do now. So let's begin. So first, um, very quick review of what you already know. So, even though we want to have a, a field theory which is relativistic because you know these particles were moving at great speeds and you need relativity, let us start with something which is familiar to everyone. Let us start with Schrodinger equation. Okay? We will worry about uh, bringing in relativity later. So, let us start with our uh, very familiar Schrodinger equation. So, what is the Schrodinger equation? It is I h bar del psi x t over d t is h psi. Okay? I will use a small h um, because I am going to use capital H later. Okay, here small h is the Hamiltonian of um, the system okay, which we are studying. So, you know what h is where let me write down here maybe here itself. So, h is minus h bar square over 2 m and you have a gradient square okay. that is a scalar quantity remember there is a dot product here. So, it is scalar under rotations plus the potential term. Okay. And this h is your operator. 
Okay, so we are imagining a um, system which is described by some potential V. Okay, and you have some particle in there, and uh, the wave function of that particle is given by psi x of t. Okay, so I am doing the old um, old thing which you all know, and here. Let me also uh, write down the eigenfunctions of H. So, if you take H, its eigenfunctions, let us label by u n of x, comma t, no, u n of x, okay, and because it is a Hamiltonian, the eigen value will be energy, I denote it by E, okay, E n u n of x okay. and n runs typically uh, it takes um, infinite value so n 1 2 3 up to infinity okay okay and let me write down your u n they are eigenfunctions Okay, of the Hamiltonian H and they form a complete set they form a complete set because they are eigenfunctions of this Hermitian operator H okay uh, because the operator is Hermitian that is why this is fine. And because they form a complete set, I can write psi as a sum of these functions, okay, as a linear sum of these functions. So, I can decompose psi as a n, okay, a n of t, u n of x and there is a summation over all the n okay that is what we can do because u n forms a complete set. Okay, And as I said before this cannot handle creation and annihilation of particles because of this reason uh, mod psi square x it has to be somewhere at all the times it cannot disappear okay good now as i was saying we will make a departure from the way we interpret psi okay so we are going to make a departure in interpreting psi. Okay. So, I do not want to treat it as a wave function of anything. I do not want to uh, say that psi describes wave function of a particle which is moving around in potential V. I do not want to do that. I just want to say psi is a classical field which satisfies this equation. Okay, that's what I want to do. Okay, one remark I wanted to make here was it's a side remark. It's not not really falling in the line of argument. But note that this equation cannot describe an electron, for example. You see, an electron you know has spin up and spin down. It has spin. Okay, so psi only gives you a number or actually two numbers because it is complex. So, I have a real part and a complex part at each uh, space time point. So, at x and at this value of x at this value of time psi has this value. Okay. So, with just this information it cannot tell uh, I mean it, there is no information or there is no provision here in this uh, in this way it is written up 
to distinguish between whether that electron has a spin up or spin down or uh, it's in some linear combination. Okay, that information is not present here. So this you can think of describing a, a particle which does not have any internal degrees of freedom. Okay, an electron has internal degrees of freedom. In in addition to where it can be, it can also be in those other uh, states which are permissible. So it could be here and be in spin up or spin down or whichever way. Okay, so that internal degree uh, degrees of freedom they are not present in this equation. But anyway, that's besides the point. So as I was saying, we'll make a departure in interpreting psi of xt and we are going to treat it as a classical field. So we will treat it as a okay, as a classical field. Okay. And now, of course, because we are not going to treat it um, as a wave function, this is not a probability density of anything. Okay. Good then. So, what should we do? I want to write down the classical theory which has Schrodinger equation as the equation of motion. Okay. Which means um, I should be able to construct an action from which I can derive Schrodinger equation as the equation of motion. Okay. What does it mean to specify a system? You, it, it means that you give the action of that system. Okay. Once you give the action, uh, everything else follows. Okay. You can uh, use variational principles. Uh, you can extremize the action, find out the equation of motion from there, construct the Hamiltonian, whatever you wish. And um, that's what means to um, you know, specify a system. So let's do that. So the goal now is to write down the action which will give this as the equation of motion. Okay, this as the equation of motion. So let's see. Um, okay, so here is the goal. I am looking at a. I am searching for a action of a system find action that gives Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation as the equation of motion. That's what we want to do. Okay, note that the system which we are going to construct will have infinite degrees of freedom because your psi describes um, uh, that that system and psi is a field. Okay, so let's see why it is an infinite. Uh, it's a system of infinite degrees of freedom. So if you write psi x of t as u n x and these coefficients a n of t okay that's the decomposition you saw before also so if your system is described by psi you see it's effectively described by a so you the u n's are wave functions they are fixed you have you have solved you have um, uh, found the eigenfunctions of the hamiltonian that small h okay these are fixed, so you know what is u1, you know what is u2, what is u1 billion, you know those, so they are there. The freedom that you have is in choosing a n's, okay. So they are the generalized coordinates for this system now, okay, and because there are infinite of them, 
you have a system of infinite degrees of freedom. Okay, that is good. And your a n's are the generalized coordinates. Okay, that's good. Now let's go back to our uh, desire to have an action for this um, theory. So we do the following. So I want to construct the action which will give this as the equation of motion. So what, what, what did we have? We had i h bar del psi over del t minus h psi is equal to 0. Okay? So this is what I want to get from my action. So let me construct the action. You see, this is what I should get when I do a variation. Okay, so let's do this. So I construct S as integral dt over a Lagrangian. Okay, and that Lagrangian I write as d cube x times this psi star x t okay and then i put this thing which you have here okay there this entire piece which you have here multiplying psi star and you will see immediately why i'm doing that okay let me make a square bracket i h bar del psi over del t and psi is at x t minus h hat h is the operator so h um, okay maybe in the next time i will specify it more but here it's fine okay plus psi x t times i h bar del psi x t over del t minus sorry um, I started doing something wrong let me that's why I was feeling strange that what am I doing okay so here is your action okay now you can see why I have constructed it this way when I take a variation with respect to psi and psi star I will get a, I will get this as the equation of motion okay let's see you see your psi is a complex function right so your psi is a complex field so it has a real part and an imaginary part okay so you can at each point you have two numbers psi r and psi r and they both are independent of each other so you can uh, use them as independent fields and do a variation or you can choose to instead work with psi and psi star it's identical okay whether you work with psi r and psi i or whether you work with psi and psi star because you can always write psi r using psi and psi star psi i using psi and psi star okay so both are equivalent so we'll work using uh, we'll work with psi and psi star so if i am looking at um, delta s a variation of s okay I'll get the following. So you have dt 
d cube x and then I do a variation of psi star and then I do a variation of psi. So, this is what we get when we do these variations. So, you have delta psi star. I am doing exactly what you do for uh, you have learned in classical mechanics. Okay, and then you have i h bar delta psi over delta t minus h psi x t plus now you take the term psi star x t I am suppressing x and t in other parts and then you have variation in this piece i h bar delta over delta t of delta psi. I okay, will suppress the other arguments minus h the Hamiltonian delta psi. Okay, maybe I should be more clear in this. Okay, here it is um, the Hamiltonian is minus h bar square over 2 m gradient square and this is acting on plus plus a v of x and this entire thing is acting on psi right and that has become delta psi for us. Okay, good. Now, if I take a, uh, if I put delta s to 0 and because delta psi star and delta psi are independent of each other, I will be able to find the equations of motion. Okay? So, first term is good, everything is fine here because you have a delta psi star. The second term is not so nice because you have a delta psi on which uh, several derivatives are operating. Here delta t is uh, time derivative is acting, here you have uh, differential operator del square acting on delta psi. So, what we want to do is we want to uh, free free up the delta psi of all these uh, operators. So, we want to uh, uh, pull them away and it is easy to do using uh, the method of integration by parts. Okay, so, I will do the integration by parts which you have learned in your school. Okay, um, this simple thing. So, that is what I am going to do. So, nothing has to be done here, only I should do something here. Okay? And remember what integration by parts does. When you integrate by parts, you take derivative from one factor and put it on the other factor and you pick up a minus sign. So, every time you pull a derivative and put on the next one, next factor, okay, you pick up a minus sign and of course, there are boundary terms which you generate, which will, which um, I will leave for you to figure out why I am not writing those. So, let me write it down now, The um, maybe I can tell you here itself. You see, you have a delta over delta t. So, when you integ do integration by parts, this delta over delta t will shift to psi star. So, this will become delta psi star over delta t and you will get a minus sign. Okay? Then, when this term is for fine, v delta psi, there is, uh, it is okay, it is good. This one which has uh, a delta square, delta square is two derivatives, it is del dot del and del is basically del over del x. Okay? So, when you pull one derivative and put on psi star, you pick up one minus sign but you are still left with one more del. When you pick up that one and put on the psi star, you have another minus sign. So, that minus and minus makes a plus. Okay? So, neither this term is going to generate a sign nor this term. This anyway remains the same. Okay? So, these two are not going to generate any negative signs. Only the derivative gets transferred to psi star. This one will generate a minus sign. Okay, because there is only one derivative here. So, the answer is this. Let me write down. I hope 
I can let's see delta s is integral dt d cube x the first term was easy I can remember delta psi star and what you have in the bracket is basically what you will eventually get as equation of motion so that is minus no not minus i h bar delta psi over delta t minus h which is the Hamiltonian h psi okay plus the other term uh, let's go back how do I go back yeah here so this will become minus because of being uh, transferred so minus i h bar del over del t acting on psi star and you have will have a delta psi okay so let's go here so plus delta psi which i have pulled out minus i h bar del psi star over del t okay that's fine and for this one you will have uh, delta psi will be freed up which we have already written as a factor outside and you will have is a minus sign so that we should take care of and then this piece so you will have minus uh, what was that h square h bar h bar square over 2m okay del square acting on psi star and plus a v of psi star so i could i can plus v of x psi star okay these things are now acting on psi star x of t okay that's good and i hope everything is correct here it is okay fine okay now good now i have freed up delta psi star and delta psi here and because these are independent variations of two independent um, uh, variables the only way delta s can be zero is if these two factors okay in the round brackets they vanish by themselves so i get the equations of motion i h bar delta psi over delta t minus h psi which is your schrodinger equation right so i can is equal to zero i can put or let me put equal to here so i take it to the right side and the other equation i get from here so i get two equations of motion minus i h bar delta psi star over delta t is equal to h psi star okay this is h this is your hamiltonian h and as you realize this is this equation the second equation is just the complex conjugate of the first one so it's not it's not a new equation it's coming from this one and when you're taking complex conjugate that i becomes minus i and psi becomes psi star hamiltonian is there's no no complex conjugation involved here and psi becomes psi star okay so i have got the equations of equation of motion starting with this action which means that the action i wrote down is correct because it's giving me correct equations of motion and you see how i have uh, built it so i have just you know taken this piece this left hand side of the equation and put it here and multiplied with psi star okay this you can always do and you will be able to construct the action if you know the equations of motion okay very good so where we are now we have the action let's see what else
Okay. So, I was asking you to think about um, about the boundary boundary values. Okay. Let me just tell you very quickly about integration by parts in case you have forgotten. It's the simple thing. If you have a function f times g okay, and you look at d over dx, the derivative of the product, then it is df over dx g plus f dg over dx. Okay. And if I if I if I integrate if I integrate on both the sides okay you see that here the derivative is on the first factor f which you can write as a derivative on the second factor okay that is what we have done and because this term you have to take to the other side there is a minus sign which we have used and this is the one which generates the boundary terms okay if you put some a to b that is the one which is generating boundary terms and that is what i am asking you here to think about okay so uh, we'll continue further uh, looking into the system in the next video.